I am also recovering from influenza. I was gone last week from the flu, and I'm still recovering, so I'm not contagious anymore, but I will be keeping my distance and using hand sanitizer, and I will having, be having to pause to uh, take a sip, just, just letting you know I'm not dying, but I do need to uh, keep my voice. It's Lent. It's the fifth week of Lent, but Easter is coming. It is Lent when we have perhaps given up certain things, when we particularly at this time take stock of where we are, of our hearts, of what is holding us back from God, of what has hurt us, of sin, of anything evil or just plain not helpful in our lives. And by the fifth week, we start to get a little bit tired of it. Yeah, you don't, you don't have to sit there and go, oh, no, I'm holy. I don't get tired. We, we get tired of it. Particularly if you've given up something as a form of sacrifice that you genuinely love, you're starting to get tired of it. I almost would have killed somebody yesterday to get my hands on a Dr. Pepper. But I didn't because it's such a small thing, such a small thing to have given up. And that one little thing, when I crave it, I remember to pray. I remember to ask God to help me to crave God the way I crave something silly like a soda pop. And that's what our story is about today. It is Lent, but Easter is coming. We have this interaction where some Greeks, that means non-Jews, non-Hebrews, have come. They want to see Jesus. We start our story with people from the outside coming and seeking God's word. And it ends with Jesus proclaiming, when I am lifted up, meaning not only death on the cross, being physically lifted up and dying on the cross, but ascending into heaven, going to prepare a place for us, all people will be drawn to him. He's reminding the Hebrews listening to him that God's word is not just for them. It is for everybody. And that is something that we need to hear because God's word is for all of us. It doesn't matter our gender, our race, our ethnicity. It doesn't matter where we have come from. God's word, God's salvation is offered to every single one of us. And sometimes, let's be honest, sometimes in the church we need to be reminded of this. It's not just us Anglicans who got it right. God's word is for everybody. And church is not about holding it in and experiencing God's love for ourselves. It's about allowing the seed planted within each of us to die, to be buried, to break open, and to allow new life to come out. New life that feeds everyone around it. So I want to focus on the first part of our story today. I do have some seeds up here. Can everybody see this one? No, you can't, can you? It's okay, you're not supposed to be able to. It's good. Melanie's laughing at me. What kind of ridiculous question are you asking, Jenny? Can anybody see this seed? No, because it's tiny. And actually, this isn't even a very small seed. It's actually a rather large seed but it's still quite small, and yet from this seed, a whole plant can grow. A whole plant that then produces more seeds, and they can fall to the earth, protected, buried, perhaps making it through an animal or a bird's digestive tract before it gets there, and they, each one of those seeds can grow another plant. So from that one seed, literally it is potentially Millions of plants that can grow. Millions. When you think about your faith, your life, your heart, how protective of you are, are, are you of it? How much do you keep to yourself as opposed to how much do we share? Spring starts on Wednesday. 
officially, we've all seen things blooming. It's pretty early this year. We see things blooming. We see the signs. Some of us are already starting to propagate seeds, maybe in our house, for eventually planting outside. Farmers in different parts of the world are starting to till ground and get it ready for planting the seed. And all of this is done at the wisdom of the plants. Have you ever thought about that? The seeds just do what they're meant to do. They catch some of them on fur of an animal going by, only to drop off later. They get eaten by a bird, or they're light enough that they blow in the wind. If they're a bulb, they split, and they physically move in the ground and split some more. Rhizomes send out roots that will go across an entire plot of land and grow up more of their kind. The plants know what to do. They are created to do this incredible thing of dying and bringing forth more new life and more new life and more new life and then dying again. There is this cycle that we see in the natural world. And Jesus in this story to all people is saying, this is what we are also created for. This is what we are called for. This is what Jesus came to teach us how to do, how to become part of this cycle, the plan that God has for the salvation of the entire world. And it starts with dying. Now, we often think about Jesus' command to lay down our life for one another. We think about what Jesus did dying on the cross. And yes, people are called literally to die for the gospel. Some of us in this room might end up facing that choice, whether we allow ourselves physically to die. But every single one of us, every day, faces choices of a million small deaths of things that are holding us back from pursuing God and from allowing God to fill us and build us up. Let me explain what I mean. When a seed falls to the ground, it is protected. It's a shell around the seed. Think of, if you will, a pumpkin seed or a sunflower seed. You have to crack the shell open to get to the what we call the meat inside. That's the edible part. That's also the part that grows. It's not the hard shell on the outside. And that shell is there to protect the seed, to help it get through things like a bird's digestive tract. But that shell has to go if the seed is to sprout and grow and bloom. So many of us carry around this shell. So many sorts of shells. It might be just a normal, very human shell of having to take care of ourselves and care for people around us. Or it might be a shell that has been placed on us through neglect or abuse or cruelty. Or it could be a shell of our own choosing We choose to be greedy. We choose to put ourselves first. We choose not to care. We choose to judge people because they're immigrants or they talk different or we just don't like them. But if we keep those hard shells, we will completely die, just like a seed that turns rotten. That shell has to crack be broken open to allow the next phase to happen. When a seed is in the earth, a bulb, a rhizome, it is surrounded in a warm, safe place. Even in the middle of winter, down, they are kept safe. There's water, there's fertilizer and nutrients, and the seed naturally grabs that and pulls it in, and grows and feasts on it. And then it starts pushing its way up, 
Pretty soon a little sprout comes through the ground, even through the concrete. It takes one little tiny crack and plants start coming up because life is meant to find a way. And once it hits that point, there's no holding it back. It can grow into a huge tree, into a beautiful flower. They all have their place. We are the ones who declare certain plants bad or good. The plants are just plants. And this is what Jesus is saying we need to do. If we love our life here so much that we are not willing to open up to others, that we are not willing to allow God's Spirit to fill us, that we are not willing to make choices that do not always put us and our desires first, but reach out to others to offer forgiveness, to offer grace, to be quicker to listen than to talk, to be a helper, to be a comfort. If we don't allow that shell we will rot and we will die. But when that shell is broken and we allow God's word, our brothers and sisters in Christ, the Holy Spirit to feed us, to water us, to nurture us, to allow us to venture out just a little bit with support, with that good earth and that good water around us to seek the sunlight, then we can grow just like a sunflower reaching for the sky. When Jesus says, if you love your life, if you hate your life, he's using hyperbole. He's being dramatic to make a point. Jesus is not saying that you should hate yourself. Jesus is saying we all have a choice to make between what we love most, what we settle for. Do we settle for the way it is? Because that's what we know. Because we're lazy. Because we're too afraid to reach out. Or do we Take a risk. Send out that shoot. It can be lonely to think about this. What happens? What happens if I do take a risk? But look to your left, look to your right. Go online, look around, look at all of God's children across the whole world. You are not the only one. We are here to support each other. And seeds that are planted together and nurtured together grow stronger and thrive and produce even greater crops. That's the point of church, not to keep us safe, but to help us allow God to break our shells, to produce crops that multiply and provide beauty and sustenance and growth to those around us. We can't do it by ourselves. We can't. You can try. I guarantee you're not going to get very far. At some point, you're going to need help. How many wheat seeds do you think it took to make that bag of flour? One won't do it. But all of us, working together, we can become like a trellis to support each other, to lift each other up, to pray for each other, to walk with each other when we need that strength, to be honest, to speak the truth of God, to stand up for the right. Because God's truth is for the Greeks and for the whole world, for you and for me and for our neighbor and for the people who hurt us. God's truth is offered to every single one, and I am not strong enough on my own to save the world. That's why Jesus came. We struggle so much, and sometimes we 
just need to ask for help and accept help and give help. I got the flu. It stunk. <laughs> and not the flu the way we often talk about it in English. In English, we have this really bad habit of call calling everything the flu. So somebody gets a cold virus and we say, oh, they have the flu. No, they have the cold virus. There's a difference. I got influenza, fever, chills, shake, shakes, the whole nine yards, racking cough, couldn't breathe, couldn't walk across my living room. I was so weak. I had a mild case. But it was miserable for about a good seven days. And even now, at almost day 14 following having it, I'm still having trouble catching my breath because it took a toll out of me. And Jason will tell you I have sat around for the past couple days feeling pretty darn sorry for myself because I hate not being able to do what I want to do. I know that shocks you. It irritates me that I go upstairs in the house to get something and I come downstairs and I realize I forgot something so I go back upstairs and I have to sit down for 20 minutes because I can't catch my breath. That's annoying. To make matters worse or more funny, depending on your perspective, right before I came down with the flu, no laughing, right before I came down with the flu, I took a pair of Jason's glasses in to be repaired. A lens had fallen out. And literally, as I pulled up to the store, I took my sunglasses off, picked up my glasses case with my everyday glasses, took them out, and my frames fell apart. I thought, well, this is handy. At least I'm right here. So I go toddling in. Here's my husband's glasses, and this just happened outside in the parking lot. And the man looked at it and said, oh, we, we have to send those in. We can't fix them here. Do you have a spare pair of glasses? I said, I have my computer glasses. So I had the flu, and I was miserable, and I had to wear sunglasses for a whole week. Do you have any idea how annoying that is? Especially when you're a reader and your sunglasses are made for, you know, driving and distance, and so I'm reading like this. Got my glasses back. They repaired them for free. In the process of fixing the frame, they messed up the coating on my bifocals. Oh, we don't call them bifocals. Progressive lenses. And I have a line about the thickness of my pinky where I can't see anything because it's fuzzy. So I have to go get new glasses. Is any of that enough to kill me? No. Is all of it incredibly frustrating and annoying? Yes. And did it take up a lot of my focus over the past two weeks? Yes. And have I had, have I had to have some sense talked into me? <laughs> Calm down. Really, where is our focus going to be? I got to get my glasses fixed. It's not the end of the world. I caught the flu. It's not the end of the world. I've been annoyed. It's not the end of the world. Do I choose to stay in anger and frustration? Or do I choose to focus on what matters? To get up and do what needs to be done and to move on with things. This is what it means to die on a daily basis. And that might seem so small and inconsequential, but I'm here to tell you, if we can't make good decisions with the small things, we will not make good decisions with the big things because we won't be in practice. We will rot, and a tree will not grow. It's Lent, but Easter is coming. You are not the only seed. 
you have such potential to be a bag of flour that feeds many. But we have to let that shell crack open. What choice do we make? Amen.